Hello, I'm Daisy Cousins. Welcome to This Week in Social Justice. This week's biggest and baddest social justice fails include the woman-owned business being destroyed by paranoid leftists over the design of the CPAC stage and right in time for International Women's Day, the YouTube video displaying even more leftist paranoia as black and trans and non-binary people express their feelings towards the police, and depending on how long I feel like talking about the first two topics, we may even get time for a bonus topic. So let's get started. But while I have your attention, Please, please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and share this video if you like it. YouTube has been throttling independent content creators for the last several months and they are still doing it. It would really, really help me out if you hit that subscribe button and share the video if you think that it is worthy, worthy and you enjoy it. You alone can help me beat big tech censorship because it is certainly at fever pitch right now which makes my life very difficult. So please like, subscribe to my channel and share this video that would really make my day. International Women's Day is finally upon us, and leftists have been gearing up for another fabulous day of identity politics and trying to push their oppression points. Okay, that is rather cynical of me. You know, there tends to be a push to support things like businesses owned by women. And while I should think in the wake of COVID we should be supporting businesses owned by everyone, well, at least, of course, they're halfway there. But apparently that support for women-owned businesses does not extend to businesses associated with anything conservative. The Conservative Political Action Conference, or CPAC, has come and gone, and by most accounts it was a hit. It had everything from a golden statue of Donald Trump, to the man himself giving a stirring speech to the adoring crowd. Do you miss me yet? Do you miss me? Needless to say, I am devastated that I couldn't be there again this year as I was last year, but that's what happens when your supposedly non-dictatorial government decides that Australia is going to be the only country in the Western world that imposes an outbound travel ban as well as an inbound travel ban because of COVID. Anyway, despite the largely positive vibes coming out of CPAC, leave it to leftists to try to destroy any good thing. On the Saturday of the conference, a photo went viral on Twitter comparing the CPAC stage to something called the Odal Rune, a Nordic symbol that was sometimes attached to the uniforms of early 20th century German nationalists, if you know what I mean to use YouTube-friendly terminology. Now, normal people would look at this admittedly unfortunate coincidence and think, huh, that's awkward, but whatever, or they wouldn't notice it at all because normal people don't go around trying to see national socialist symbolism everywhere. But of course, given the paranoia and bad faith acting of many leftists, it turned into an absolutely giant thing. There were assertions that it was done deliberately as, a, as an insidious dog whistle to white supremacists. There was a campaign to boycott Hyatt Hotels, hashtag buy Hyatt was trending on Twitter. Both Hyatt and the American Conservative Union had to put out statements denouncing the comparison and making it very, very clear that it was not in fact deliberate. Not that they should have actually needed to do that because, like I said, any normal person would not think it was deliberate or they wouldn't notice it at all. And eventually Hyatt and the ACU started feuding because Hyatt put out some derogatory comments about the conference attendees and then of course the ACU fired back. Huge drama. And all because of some hysterical lefties, whether they were genuinely acting in bad faith or are just completely ignorant of the fact that not only did the conference have a number of Jewish speakers, but Donald Trump was the most pro-Jewish, pro-Israel president in American history, given his stoic defense of Israel and the moving of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem 
and the fact that one of his campaign promises going into the 2020 election was an initiative called the Platinum Plan, designed to do things like invest in black businesses and black communities and officially designate both Antifa and the KKK as terrorist organizations, none of which a sympathizer of early 20th century German nationalists would do, decided to cause some trouble. So, while all this was going on, nobody seemed to bother to look up who was actually responsible for the stage design. Hyatt Hotels just lumped responsibility on the ACU, who of course denied that there was anything deliberate about it, because obviously there wasn't. Eventually, the company who designed the stage, a company named Design Foundry, came forward to claim responsibility, saying that they were mortified and denounced any and all symbols of hate, etc, etc, etc. According to the terms of the contract signed with Design Foundry, the ACU approved the stage design but had no rights to change the design or dismantle the stage. They were also provided with a number of options for the stage design and picked the one that they stated was the most workable. No conspiracy, no anti-Semitism, nothing like that, obviously. Nevertheless, CPAC will not be using the services of Design Foundry again, even though the company has worked with CPAC for several years. Now, if you're a crazy lefty, you'd assume at this point that your best efforts to cancel what must obviously be a far-right, straight white male-owned business has paid off. Now that obviously racist cis white man who obviously owns Design Foundry will never work again, which is great because anybody who works with CPAC must be a white supremacist. Only that wasn't the case, not even close. According to Yahir Ali, who writes for New York Magazine and HuffPost, and who is not a conservative, by the way, Design Foundry is actually owned by a woman who is a Biden supporter. I know Design Foundry because they handle design for many events in DC for companies like MSNBC and Target. They oversaw the design for the Biden Cancer Summit in 2018. The owner, Annie, is very liberal and was so excited for Biden's victory. Great work, conspiracy theorists. Also worth noting that many of her employees are liberal. So many of you decided to go after something without any reporting or knowledge about who was responsible for the design. And before you ding her for working for CPAC, you try having an events business during a pandemic. An event design company that's coming up with a stage design does nothing to help CPAC or elevate its status in any way. What it does do is keep people in the event business employed during a pandemic which has destroyed businesses and jobs. And none of you will admit you got it wrong or apologize because in your minds it means you're caving into Trump. Now, an event company, which is a liberal owned and run small business, is associated with a horrific allegation that is based on conspiracies and no evidence. That pretty much says it all. In the lead up to International Women's Day, a time when these very same hysterics are well on the hashtag support women's businesses train, they chose to kill a woman owned leftist run business because they were so blinded by their hatefulness, ignorance, and paranoia. They jumped at the first shadow they could find without bothering to investigate, well, anything. But really, what more or less would you expect from them? Massive social justice fail to left-wing hysterics on this one. Ladies and gentlemen, the YouTube channel Cut has once again delivered unto us some of the best slash worst SJ content you will ever see. I'm sure some of you will remember their video from late last year. So what exactly are white people superior at? What are white people superior at? <laughs> white people are great at having fun. That's a function of white supremacy because they just don't have as many stresses as we do. White people are very superior at their privilege and utilizing it. We do not have the privilege to do whatever and however we want to. <laughs> well, now they've come up with another doozy. Trans women and non-binary people of color give their thoughts on the police. Let's watch some of it, shall we? In one word, what is police? Give me a second because um, I don't like that word. <laughs> Corrupt. What is police? Criminals. Policing has always been systemically set up to interrogate and terrorize black people and people of color. In one word, what is police? Violence. Fear. Brutality. Whenever a police car is in the back of me, you think of worst case scenario and you think of problems. I got into a 
car accident with a police officer and I immediately was in tears. I was shaking. I thought I was gonna be killed. I had a kid in my car. I immediately told them to close their eyes. Uh, police scared me. I've always, since I was little, had something in me that was uncomfortable around police, even being young and not knowing really anything about it. Whenever police come around, I feel at risk. Even with the protests that we're having now, the police are in opposition. You can visibly see that we're at war with these forces that claim to protect us and value us, and they don't. Police have become these symbols of oppression. Police used to protect me and my mom when my stepdad used to hit me. And now the police are something to fear. Okay, so unlike with the what are white people superior at video, I'm not going to sit here and laugh at this because I find what was portrayed by these video participants to be particularly disturbing. The fear expressed here, I am guessing, is based on the narrative that there is an epidemic of police violence against unarmed black people in the USA. You know, that black people are at an inherent risk of being killed for no reason by racist white police officers and that the police can never be trusted. Tennis champion Naomi Osaka described it last year as a continued genocide of black people at the hand of police and refused to play a semi-final match in protest. The response to her, sa her statement in the media and on social media was wild adulation and the tournament she was playing in suspended play for a day in solidarity with her statement. So evidently there are an awful lot of people out there who buy into the genocide of black people at the hands of police narrative. Genocide being defined by the Oxford Dictionary as the deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially those of a particular race or nation. Only that is simply not the case, not in terms of race or numbers. According to the Washington Post police shootings database, only 18 unarmed black people were shot in the USA in 2020. If you add the amount of unarmed black people who were killed by police in other ways, according to mapping police violence, the number increases to 32. That's the grand total. In fact, more unarmed white people were shot and killed by police in 2020 than black people, and the data for all of this is similar in previous years. And while that number should be zero, it is not what you would call a genocide or an epidemic, not even remotely close. Now, while of course black people have been killed by police at a disproportionately high rate given population size, it is important to remember that the violent crime rate among black communities is also disproportionately high, tragically so. It is a self-perpetuating cycle that nobody wants to talk about for fear of being labeled racist. And so it just goes on and on and on, and more and more black men die, sometimes at the hands of cops, but it is vastly more likely to be at the hands of other black men. So while ignorant leftists like Naomi Osaka and those in the cut video opine about how terrible the police are and how terrifying it is when the police come around, this cycle of violence and murder continues in black communities and innocent people continue to die. But don't mention that publicly or you will get screamed at relentlessly since that doesn't fit the approved narrative. Now that's not to say that black people haven't ever been victimized by police because of their race, of course they have. There have been huge problems with corrupt, racist police officers for decades, and there are still racist cops nowadays, obviously. It is and always has been totally unacceptable and must be rooted out wherever it occurs. But to have that kind of a visceral reaction to the mention of the word police in a 2020-2021 context, or to characterize what happens now as a genocide of black people or an epidemic, shows not only a willful ignorance of the facts, but also an unwillingness to do or say anything to address the tragic cycle of trauma and violence that perpetuates in cities like Baltimore. Meanwhile, innocent people die. Massive social justice failed to cut on this one. Bonus topic. We have a bonus topic this week. Now, this isn't a social justice topic specifically, but I thought it was pretty funny, so I wanted to include it. Now, we've all made jokes about how sleepy Joe Biden might be losing his marbles here and there, and that's why his team has kept calling an unofficial lid on his public appearances, so to speak. Well, it seems that the other day, Joe Biden felt more than up to answering questions during a virtual event. Only his staffers, handlers, whatever you want to call them, seem to feel otherwise. Thank you, thank you. And I'm happy to take questions if that's what I'm supposed to do, Nance, whatever you want me to do.
okay, so it is possible that they'd simply run out of time and that Biden and others had to get another appointment. I mean, there are plenty of reasons why they pulled the plug other than Biden's alleged cognitive state. But regardless, the timing is undeniably hilarious. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment. And if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me. Mm -hmm.